ever feel like you're not part of the conversation? That you're not getting the full picture on the important issues. Or the stories that impact your life. Jim, who was on in the last hour waiting a year for a heart operation, blew us out of the water. Well, at Talk TV, we cover the issues you care about. I would love to give the nurses a massive pay rise. Give them one, then. With proper debate and argument. We tell it how it really is. And have some fun along the way. Talk TV for the stories that matter. And good afternoon, I'm Ian Collins, and you're with Talk on TV, radio, online, and your smart speaker. Coming up this afternoon, Prince Andrew and Bill Clinton are among high-profile figures named in US court papers detailing connections of the late sex offender Jeffrey Epstein. What does this mean for those named? We'll look at that. Also, Keir Starmer has set out his pitch to become Prime Minister this year. As Rishi Sunak hints at an autumn election, we'll have full details. And that Talk TV exclusive has revealed that three devil dogs were destroyed every day last year. This comes as the government looks to crack down on dangerous dogs across the country. And it's Josh Call. This show is all about your response and your opinions. If you want to react to any of the stories today, you can call us now. The lines are open 0344 499 1000, text 87222, or on the socials, it's at Talk TV. But first, let's get the latest news headlines with Katie. Hello there. We're having some technical difficulties. We will be back with you very shortly indeed. But in the meantime, it's back to Ian in the studio. Reports are now coming in of a mass shooting in the American state of Iowa. There are reports of multiple people being shot at at Perry High School. And that ambulances and Medivac helicopters are at the scene. The school is 25 miles northwest of Des Moines. Rishi Sunak appears to have ruled out a May general election. Instead, he's hinting at an autumn poll. The working assumption is we'll have a general election in the second half of this year. And in the meantime, I've got lots that I want to get on with. Uh, this Saturday, we'll be introducing a significant tax cut for millions of people in work, worth on average £450 for an average worker. Because we've halved inflation, we want to keep managing the economy well and cutting people's taxes. And I want to keep tackling illegal migration. The PN's comments come just hours after Labour leader Sir Keir Starmer gave his New Year's speech, saying the opportunity to shape Britain's future rests in the public's hands. The hope of democracy, the power of the vote, the potential for national renewal, the chance finally to turn the page, lift the weight off our shoulders, unite as a country and get our future back. Prince Andrew, Bill Clinton, Donald Trump and Stephen Hawking are among those named in court documents relating to Ghislaine Maxwell, her relationship with Jeffrey Epstein and alleged victims of sexual abuse. Well, the newly unsealed court documents name dozens of Epstein's associates, although many of them are not accused of any wrongdoing. Criminal defence attorney and legal author Joseph Tully says anyone in the spotlight is advised to keep quiet. I would advise them to stay silent, let this blow over. There's going to be so much out there that uh, the more you talk, the more you're going to draw attention to yourself. So I think we're going to see a lot of people sort of crawl into a hole and hope that it blows over. A 49-year-old man has been arrested after police received reports of shots being fired at three locations in Liverpool last night. It led to a manhunt while a major incident was declared. Armed officers and police helicopters were patrolling the streets and residents were told to stay indoors. The first report of shots was received from a shop with further incidents outside a cinema and at a nearby property. No one was injured. An investigation by Talk TV has exclusively revealed that three devil dogs were destroyed by police forces across England and Wales every single day last year. A freedom of information request from 35 forces shows that 3,823 dogs were seized for being aggressive or attacking people in the year to October 2023. More than 1,000 were destroyed by officers, which is up 143%. Emma Whitfield is the mother of Jack Lees, who was fatally attacked by an XL bully in 2021. He came back from school, he went out to play, and about 10 minutes later, there was a knock at the door to tell me Jack had been attacked by a dog. Um, 
So I got round to where he was, which was his friend's house, and it was chaos. That is the latest. It's now time for the weather, though, with Nazneen Gavan. Times Radio sponsors Talk TV Weather. Hello. It's looking a lot dry for the vast majority of the UK for this afternoon, but across southern areas, it's really looking rather wet. We're seeing a mass of rain, as you can see from the earlier satellite and radar picture, coming in from the southwest, along with gusty winds and spreading eastwards across many southern counties of England and Wales through this afternoon, then later towards some eastern areas too. Some heavy downpours falling on already saturated ground could cause some flooding issues, particularly around the Weymouth area towards Hastings. Meanwhile, the rest of England and Wales seeing a few showers across northern England, otherwise sunny and Northern Ireland also some showers as well as for central and western parts of Scotland. North East Scotland for Shetland and Orkney will see some spells of rain. Overnight, as I said, that rain will continue across parts of eastern England, so from Lincolnshire down towards the East Midlands, East Anglia and the South East, eventually easing by the early hours of the morning. It won't be too cold there compared to elsewhere where there will be clear skies, so lows of around 4 or 5 degrees Celsius, a few showers around coastal areas of the west. Tomorrow, eventually that rain eases away as the low pulls away eastwards, but it's it's quite cloudy with some scraps of rain likely around some eastern parts of the UK. Everywhere else will be mostly bright and largely dry for central parts, but western areas, some showers. Times Radio sponsors Talk TV Weather. And good afternoon. Now, last night we got the New Year news we've all been waiting for. Previously redacted names of disgraced sex offender Jeffrey Epstein's expansive network of friends and business associates has been revealed. Popcorn at the ready as nearly a thousand pages of court records have been unsealed. Names on the list include Prince Andrew, Bill Clinton, Donald Trump and Stephen Hawking. It's important to stress at this point, by the way, that even if you've been named in these files, it doesn't mean you're actually guilty of any crime. But let's row back a bit. Just who was Jeffrey Epstein? Remember, this is a man who's dominated the news agenda for the best part of a decade. He was known for associating with celebrities, politicians and billionaires. He created a shield of power around him. But the story really started in 2005, when he was arrested and accused of paying a 14-year-old girl for sex. He spent time in prison and many of his close, quaint, uh, close acquaintances deserted him. But not everybody. Epstein continued to associate himself with the rich and famous. But dozens of sexual allegations started to mount against him, including sex trafficking and an infamous island where suspected crimes took place. Epstein went back to jail. But victims saw no justice when in 2019, while awaiting trial, Epstein killed himself inside his prison cell. So let's move forward to 2021, where Epstein's girlfriend, Ghislaine Maxwell, became central to this story. She was prosecuted for helping recruit his underage victims. She's now serving 20 years in prison. Maxwell is angry that given this is about men abusing girls, the only person in prison, so far at least, is her. But in recent years, the story has come closer to home. Prince Andrew became embroiled in the scandal after Virginia Dufre, a victim of Epstein, alleged that she was made to have non-consensual sex with the Duke. Andrew denies it, including appearing on Newsnight to proclaim his innocence. His credibility, though, has been shot to pieces. The prince has stepped back from royal duties and he settled with Dufre outside of court. It cost him and his mother, the late queen, tens of millions of pounds. He's now only seen in public on rare occasions, including Sandringham this Christmas. But the smart money says he will never return to America. But today, for the first time, we have more detail on the world of Epstein. The people named in the records include, include make for some interesting reading. Bill Clinton is accused of liking them young. Prince Andrew is alleged to have taken part in an orgy and on Epstein's island. And Stephen Hawking, whose name None of us suspected is also in print. But again, there's no solid evidence of illegality. And though there are more revelations to come over the next few weeks, has anything really been achieved here with Epstein dead and everyone in denial? Would this disturbing story 
ever move beyond rumour and innuendo? We'll take your comments on this as well. 0344 499 1000. Before we get into the rest of the show, let's bring you some more on that breaking news from the US state of Iowa in the past half an hour. We're hearing it's feared there could be multiple victims after a shooting occurred at Perry High School in Iowa this morning. We know there are at least five ambulances, multiple police units, air ambulance helicopters and firefighters are on the scene. The school is about 25 miles northwest of Des Moines and today is the first day back for students after the winter break. We'll have more on that as we get it. I'm joined now by the broadcaster and journalist Claire Muldoon to chew over the big stories of the day. Happy New Year Hi, to you, Claire. Happy New Year. And happy birthday, by Thank the way. Yeah. I was about to say you, you kept that quiet, there. but you didn't. didn't. It was the first I thing didn't. you said to me. Uh, it is, Everyone knows. It is the big day. Um, let's have a look at this Jeffrey Epstein mm. story. This is kind of this is confusing to me. I mean, the, <clears> the headline, <throat> which has been said a thousand times, it is the point that Ghislaine Maxwell does correctly make yeah. is that given this is meant to be industrial scale mm. abuse yeah. of young girls by rich and powerful men, the mm. only person inside a prison cell is a woman. Is a woman. You know, that just fits into that misogynistic patriarchal narrative, doesn't it? And, you know, it's, it's not... I mean, obviously what happened there, there was things that happened there that is just beyond comprehension. Um, there was paedophilia there, clearly, because it's alleged that the, children, the girls were under the age of consent and the fact they had non, it's alleged that there's non-consensual non yeah, acts yeah. of sexuality as well and sex acts. Um, and, you know, you said that um, it cost Prince Andrew dearly. It did, because he had to step back from public duty. But the financial fiscal cost mm. of tens of millions of pounds, you know, people in this country will look to that and say, well... We helped fund the monarchy. Yeah, yeah. We paid for that. We want answers. Fair point. So there's many victims to this, um, notwithstanding, of course, Stephen Hawking. I mean, who would have thought his name would have been in the frame? Um, Microsoft, Bill Gates, we've already heard his name before as well. Of course, this is all alleged. There's been nothing proven, but well, the only one that's in prison at the moment is Ghislaine Maxwell. It, which is extraordinary. It I mean, is. it should be said as well, a lot of the people named are people that happen to know him went on his plane or went to an island. I mean, because, you know, on that basis... But, Ian, have you, you, did you read as well, interestingly, that Trump has been, for want of a better word, almost exonerated? Because yes. he has been, you know, he alleged, but he has actually been, it's been proven by the fact that he didn't go on any of Epstein's yep. jets or planes, he didn't take any of his calls, and he wasn't, in fact, a, 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 a crony of his which you know, is quite surprising considering oh, the rest of the... But the he was, he was, he's was he been Trump. photographed with him, though, hasn't he, in the past? But, I mean, that's not the point, is it? Because, I, I mean, there is a, a reasonable defence, because otherwise we'd have to say that any of us who know somebody today, if the person you know goes on to commit some horrendous crime, are we therefore all guilty by association well, because we once we, knew them? Exactly. And that's the problem, isn't it? There's lots of other celebrities that are the... <clears throat> momentarily mentioned, very briefly in this as well, some really famous A-listers, but they're not accused of anything. Yeah, but there's also the other problem and we've been discussing this in our house recently about naming people perpetrators of crime. Yeah, yeah. Right. Particularly these kind of crimes. Particularly, crash. and I don't think that's healthy. I don't think it's it's relevant. But apparently the reason is you if you name someone that someone had if you believe that you've been raped or sexually abused and you go to the police and you make a complaint mm. and you you want this dealt with, to name the person is actually to enable any other person who's felt that they've actually been um, affected by the same um, um, ill-gotten um, yeah, yeah. violence as well or sex crimes or whatever so it doesn't sit well with me I would rather people had you know a fair trial instead of now being tried by media yep. tried by public I wish it would be done behind closed doors and let the victims process what's happened to them and hopefully justice will be served I, I would agree and I think with you know, the other thing you have to remember, before anybody really knew much about Epstein in this respect, yeah. you know, he was a philanthropist, he yes. was a very rich man. Yes. He did put on flights to different conferences around the world. It wouldn't be uncommon that somebody like Gates or Stephen Hawking would be at one of those yeah. events. So, by association, people... Have, I mean, I'm, I'm looking... If ever there was an argument to close down social media, it was today. I agree I mean, with some you. of the stuff that is being written out there is unbelievable. Some of the memes as well. Oh, have the memes some of the as memes? well. Yeah, there's some... I know that there's, you know, gallows humour and there's some... <laughs> 
there are there are some sort of interesting interpretations in that sort of dark humor kind of way but uh, it, it's the people that purport to be serious journalists. They're I not. Know. They're just somebody, know. you know, who self-identifies as a journalist. Good who, point there, who, who posts lots of stuff yeah. and says, you know, I am told that, you know, this A-lister, that A-lister were also... Well, they might have been on an island. They might have been on a plane. It doesn't make them a sex offender or a paedophile. I know. I mean, if you extend that, then lots of people buy association. Mm -hmm. You know, so then you get people who... So, well, Donald Trump did nothing wrong, but Donald Trump had previously confessed to being a sex offender himself. You know, he said, you know, he it's talked about... And then you've got Bill working. Clinton, who we know, he likes them young. Well, we know he had a ding-dong with a 22-year-old uh, intern yeah. some years ago. Yeah. And she was 22 when he yeah. was the president. So yeah. that shouldn't be news. Uh, I, I, it wouldn't surprise Bill, me at all. Bill, Bill Clinton's quite interesting, actually, because, you know, t professionally as a politician, he was wonderful for the Good Friday Agreement. You know, yeah, he, yeah, he yeah, did yeah, a absolutely. lot of, of work for... Um, Mo Molam at the time and Blair, and he was a great statesman. And when he was senator of Albuquerque, I think was his state. You know, he was, he was apparently a, a wonderful senator. He was great but for like the people. Loads of those. He was insatiable when he, he couldn't. You know, they had to at, lock up the cushions Monica, in Monica, the Oval Office, Monica you know. Lewinsky. Monica Lewinsky. You know, you wonder what in earth his daughter and his wife Hillary actually had to put up with. Yeah. It's and they shame. still they still it's get a shame. they still get snapped as the happy family as well. Oh, which I, I don't so, believe for I know, one second. It's so uh, sad. And what about Keir Starmer? He's, who's not, by the way, on that list. Uh, Keir Starmer is in the news for another reason today. He's there, of course, because he set out his project in Oak Bristol. Was he in Bristol calls. today? Yes, he was, and he was there because he thought, you know, this is a, a clearly an even playing field to be able to sort of sell my stall and tell everybody, look, vote for me. I'm going to be the next prime minister. He wants economic he can't growth. Trust yeah, who, he's not gonna, he's who not doesn't gonna, want economic growth? I know, growth? right? He's not going to shut down uh, any talks of uh, lowering income tax um, and he needs people to get together. And the, yep. the other flaming thing that he put in his speech that I was really quite cross about was the fact that I don't blame anyone that's anti-Westminster. Where's the cohesiveness in all of that? I know. Call it out for what it is, Keir. No one likes the Tories in at the moment, if that's your message that you want to say. Don't... Don't conflate anything, especially Correct. for the devolved governments, by saying, I don't blame you if you hate Westminster yeah, yeah. at the moment. Grow up, Gro Keir, yeah, please. It's, it's a fair point. Uh, I hope you're watching, Keir. Claire Muldoon says, grow up, man. What's <laughs> and, wrong with you? And grow up here. Well, he did respond kind of tacitly to, to what uh, Richard Tice had said yesterday about there's no real difference between Tories and, and Labour. He says, don't... Well, that was Blair's fault, of course. Well, of course, absolutely. He says, don't listen to the siren voices that say we're all the same. He said, we are not and we never will be. Do you know what? I can't really find, at the moment... A the, USP? The, yeah, I can't yeah. find... And also the size of a, a, a kind of an obvious chasm that I could say, there lies the big difference. Mm. I, when Corbyn was there, I mean, to be fair, to, in some respects, I preferred Corbyn. I agree. Because I, I could I'm say, that's a, that's a late, that's a proper traditional yep. Labour bloke. Yep. He might talk cobblers, he might make no sense. Don't but forget, though, he, he represents... was the only one that said that everyone, we should have free Wi Fi everywhere. And look, we've got it. Yeah. You know, he has made good points, but anyway, I think the point you are it's making... the Wi-Fi card. Yeah, the, the point I'm making is that Corbyn <laughs> was a difference. But there is no difference, is there now? No real, sizable difference Do you know what? The there was a programme started last night, and we love Claudia Winkleman in our house, yeah. and there was a brilliant programme started called The Traitors. I've been seeing this advertised with Winkleface. How's well, she doing Winkle on Fringe. It? Yes. And the other great thing is they've got a board game out, and we got it for Christmas and played it. It's like Parliament. You've got cesp you've got like the cesspit of the traitors... Really? and the faithfuls, and see trying to wake out, you know, from the, the partners, from my children's partners, if they're traitors. Woe betide me if any of them were traitors. Is it, I'd is it a good board game? Great. Is it? Yeah. Might I got that... killed twice in it. Oh, that's a shame. I'm just I'm, on the eve of your birthday as well. It wasn't even my eve of the birthday. Sorry yet. to hear this, Claire. This is devastating <gasps> stuff devastating going on in the stuff. Muldoon house. How festive is that? It's a murder. Matricide, there's Indeed. been a murder. Uh, militant medics refuse to help patients. Oh, Striking junior sake. doctors have turned down desperate pleas by hospital bosses to provide critical emergency Isn't services. Isn't this just shocking? These people are losing the room by they the really... minute, aren't they? Well, if we, it used to be able to call, used to be able to call it a waiting room. No yeah. one can see the doctors now, so there's no waiting in the room. Yep. So talk about reading the room. They're reading it, Ian, because there's no one there and there's no backlash. And the, the unions, for the unions to turn round and say that the, is it, what's the term, derogation? Um, they're using, the government are using that as a whip to whip up a storm against the junior doctors from the public's point of view is utter tosh. Yeah. Because people are sick of this now. 
they, these young doctors aren't being paid when they're off on strike. Who doesn't need money post-Christmas? Who doesn't need money in New Year to get up back well, up? Well, you've probably got the bank of mum and dad going on well, in some there, of those. Well, there a lot might of those be a lot of that. Not that I'm going to stereotype doctors as rather privileged middle-class people, but I think there might be some of that. But also, I mean, they've had 20 requests from NHS bosses to say, you know, would you would you not strike and come back to what we need yeah, you we need at the fault face? And they're still this digging their heels in and saying This is all about Hippocratic Oath, no. you know, which they take you would to become so. a doctor. You, you know, to so. preserve life at all costs. Yeah. Well, they're not doing it. And I'm sorry, their pain conditions aren't that bad. I'm not, they work damn hard. I'm glad that they do. It's a rite of passage yep. because they know it's a vocation. They've chosen to do five years at medical school plus all the extra training when they're still in as junior doctors before they get their um, F1 or F2 positions and then go into their speciality field. I'm sorry, I've got no sympathy with them at all. They started off demanding, what was it, 25%? 35. 35. Got themselves out of the room immediately. Yeah, of course. Absolutely. Of course. And some ridiculous. of them are still insisting. And this is about the British Medical Association, which is an oh, they're not fit Marxist, for purpose. They are hard not fit left. For purpose. I mean, hard left. You know, they, they make Mick Lynch look like the Conservatives. <laughs> I mean, they are properly out there, like, like something from Venezuela in 1978. That's how these guys Do you operate. Know why they hate the Venezuela? Tories, and that's what because they want to do. Because of the Christmas Caracas. Boom, boom. I like it. You like it. We finish on humour <laughs> from Claire Bullitt. Good to see you, Claire. And you too. Enjoy the rest of your birthday. Thank you very much. I can't wait. Have a good one. Claire Thank Baldwin you. with us here on Talk TV. Coming up after the break, Epstein's sordid network exposed. Court documents reveal the convicted sex offender's high-profile network that included princes and presidents. I'm Ian Collins, and you're with Talk TV on TV, radio, online, and your smart speaker. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. We're on your smart speaker as well. Criminals using XL bully dogs as weapons to threaten others. No matter how well trained, most dog owners will tell you a dog can turn. Do you know what I love about Talk Today? We do it all. Sunak, Suella, scones. I rather like David Cameron. I don't sort of bear him any ill will because he delivered the referendum that he said he would deliver. The Tories love a scrap. You can almost see this coming round the tracks with Suella Bravman. She's heading up one side and Rishi soon at the other. The police are pro-Palestine. That is just not right. You swear an oath in the police to act without fear or favour. The Covid inquiry seems to have turned into a sort of pantomime. There's not really any substance to it. It's hard to know whether it's a farce or a tragedy. The amount of time it's taken, the number of illegal migrants currently sent by us to Rwanda, zilt. The amount of money it's cost, we're saying, what are we saying it's cost? About 140 million. 140 million pounds so far. So 140 million pounds so far result nil, absolutely nil. Are we only going to be trusting sources like Meta and Google? Where is our unbiased news going to come from? Calais in winter is cold. <laughs> that is from the Jeremy Corbyn book. Kevin O'Sullivan is the worst presenter on Talk TV. Sitting on his fat ass <laughs> talking for a living. If you're walking towards me and you're a vegan, you have a great big orange sticker over here saying, watch out, vegans about. The weirdest plank that we've had in, what, yeah. three years? Hundreds and hundreds of mice in a box, which he walks into a branch of McDonald's. McMouse Man. McMouse Man, yeah. McMouse Man. He should be easy enough to catch this guy, shouldn't he? I mean, he's got a house full of mice. He's on <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> This is a major summit. President Biden decided this is important after watching a Tom Cruise film. Sunak and the current Conservative government are not conservative. Why don't you leave that party and come to one that actually shares oh, your ideology? This has been a party political broadcast uh, on behalf no, of I the don't. Reform UK party. Hi, I'm off calm. Just... Kids think all they have to do is take pictures of everything. Just shut down TikTok. Problem solved. This is really unfair. What's, what, what's unfair? If it's on camera, we're not doing the interview. Yes, I'm going to do. I'm going going to, you're going to resign? Yes, because I cannot continue my work. When I say I am God, I'm not joking. Did you feel Elvis was controlling? I've been answering your question, you answer mine. It's actually not my job to answer your questions. Just Are you prepared you. to call is Hamas a have, terror group? Is it possible to have a rational you discussion can't, can with you? you? I've asked you two questions. Should Hamas stay in power and are they a terror group? You're refusing to answer either of them. They that won't. is very telling. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. You've done a book on poetry. Poetry and music for the many. I love poetry. We can agree on that.
And welcome back to the show. I'm Ian Collins. You're with Talk TV on TV, radio, online, and of course on your smart speaker, as expected. Prince Andrew and Bill Clinton have been named in court documents related to convicted sex offender Jeffrey Epstein. The record sealed as part of the case against Epstein's girlfriend, Ghislaine Maxwell, exposed an international web of high profile associates. But despite the release of about 900 pages. No new bombshell revelations about Epstein have yet emerged, with more documents expected to be disclosed in the coming days. Joining me now is Ari Fudali, a partner at the New York legal firm Bloom, which has represented nine of Epstein's victims. Good afternoon to you, sir. Good afternoon. Nice to have you with us. Uh, I mean, let's just start with a, a line that has been repeated many, many times. Um, this is essentially a story of industrial scale sex abuse, rape, um, and many other uh, offences uh, by men on young girls. And yet the only person currently serving time in jail is a woman. You couldn't make that up. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's a fair point. However, you can't forget that Jeffrey Epstein was behind bars and then killed himself. You know, one thing I, I find interesting about a lot of this investigation is people, I think, are surprised to learn of the breadth of Epstein's abuse. People assume that since there are so many victims that have accused Epstein of wrongdoing, that there was this wide ring of sex trafficking where Epstein was providing these young women to all these men. And when in reality, Epstein had multiple victims, multiple young women victims, multiple times a day for decades. He really was the center of this sex trafficking ring, and he deserved to be behind bars. And it's, you know, unfortunate for a lot of the victims that he took the, the coward's way out. But even... You know, when we've heard, we've heard from victims and there's been some innuendo out there and some rumour and, you know, sometimes you have to do your own due diligence and kind of separate the, the, the rumour mill from, from reality. Um, but, but there's no... I mentioned there wasn't a big... a bombshell revelation. And you, you, you might think by now, you know, we've heard about Prince Andrew. And that's kind of it, really. I mean, th th wouldn't there be this raft of dozens of very high-profile presidents and billionaires and plutocrats that we could all reel off by now? We've got nobody, really. Right. Well, I think we're sort of numb to it at this point. I think it's been so well publicized and a bit of the sensationalism about Epstein News and all of the very high profile people he's associated with. So there were names, you know, listed, of course, or names that we saw in these documents, but they are names, like you, as you stated, that we've heard before. So while had these names all just come out only in these documents and we'd never heard them before, it would be bombshell. But since we've heard these names over and over again and have been so well-versed in the, the people that Epstein associated himself with, it's just no longer a surprise to us. Yeah. Um, and you well know as a, a lawyer, I know the laws of libel and the like are very different in the States, but, uh, I mean, I, I've lost count of how many of these alleged lists of people I've seen over the last couple of years, and last night was no different. Uh, Twitter did its thing. And just, if they fancied it, they just invented some names or they made all manner of accusations. So it's, it becomes very hard as an objective onlooker. And I, I think you hit on it there as well. We, we may have some fatigue over this a little bit because names are just coming out all over the place. Uh, you know, we've even had people like Jimmy Kimmel that was mentioned, as I'm sure you're aware, and he's put out a robust public defence. Um, and there were other A-list names mentioned, but not mentioned in the capacity of being... Uh, potential perpetrators. You're absolutely right. And I think the other part of it, what I mentioned before, the sensationalism is somehow this has become a thing about a list. People thought there was going to be some sort of list of his associates, you know, a list of people who he provided young women to. And that was never the, that was never the case. There was never any rumor of a list. You know, I hear all the time as someone who's represented, yeah. you know, multiple victims of Epstein, you know, where's this list? There is no list from what I can tell. These are just documents that were produced through discovery in a civil case. And as, as you said, sort of through the Twitter mill and sort of through all the, you know, the media about this, there's been, it's people I think expected more of a bombshell than actually what was revealed. Yeah, I think so. And, you know, in terms of, you as a lawyer, you've, you've represented victims. Are, are most of those, and I'm, I'm respecting client confidentiality and all the rest of it here, but just broadly speaking, are, are these accusations aimed solely at Epstein or others? Yeah, I mean, for the most part, as, as I, you know, it's, it really was, it was Jeffrey Epstein. And I think people can't understand really 
the magnitude of the abuse he did in his life. He's the most prolific sexual predator of our time. And when I say multiple women a day for decades, and I mean it, that's how bad it was. Just a constant flow of young women, young women that he'd manipulate to recruit for him, uh, to bring more young women to him. It was a constant flow of abuse for decades, even after in 2008, when he actually had to plead guilty to procuring sex with a minor, it didn't stop him and he continued to do it. So really the substantial allegations. Now, of course, we've heard other allegations out there. From my understanding, that most of the allegations are against Jeffrey Epstein himself. Uh, it should be said as well that uh, you could be an associate of Epstein's. Um, many people over the years probably knew a very different man from the sex offender. I'm not saying this is any kind of defense of him, but more a defense of those people that found themselves on these, as you rightly say, these curious lists uh, that everybody's waiting for the big drop. Um, somehow, huge revelations of famous people. Um, just because somebody once knew the man or just because somebody even went on a private plane or went on a business trip doesn't make them... A, a sexual deviant, it doesn't make them a criminal. They could, you know, I'm sure the guy had many associates over many decades who were perfectly ordinary law-abiding people. That's absolutely correct. And we know for a fact that Jeffrey Epstein surrounded himself by powerful people. He himself was a powerful person. He was very wealthy. He donated a lot of money. He threw his money around in order to gain more influence. So you're, you're absolutely right. Just association with Jeffrey Epstein is certainly not a crime. Uh, and he used his power and influence and his and his connections as a means of exerting control over his victims. Are you not surprised, though, Eric, just to go back to where we began this conversation, that there aren't, you know, maybe just even half a dozen big names out there that we would be uh, talking about right now, those with the, 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 certainly the profile or the status of Epstein? There, there might be more by now. There, there appears to... Other than the innuendo and the rumour... You know, Bill Clinton liked them young. Well, we know that. He had a thing with an intern some years ago. He was twice her age. And, you know, Donald Trump was a mate, but he's accused of nothing there. But we know Trump's had a fairly colourful past himself. That Even allowing for that, there's no, there's no real, tangible, obvious, unequivocal example of another Epstein-like big player here. Yeah, I, so, I mean, I, I guess to answer your question, what I know about Jeffrey Epstein and what I would have learned, you know, in the past few years investigating him, I, I'm not surprised that there wasn't sort of some sort of bombshell of incriminating evidence against another powerful person. And again, this goes back to the fact that this wasn't, from my understanding, what I've learned, a, a sex trafficking ring where Epstein was just providing women to all these all these men. Epstein was providing women to himself. And that's what I think the public has a difficulty understanding, yeah. how many women he abused and how it really was just about him. And he used his connections with these powerful individuals uh, as a means of control and exertion of power. And he, you know, he would show his victims pictures of himself with these very powerful people. So again, I'm not shocked, at least at this point, that we haven't seen anything else incriminating about a high-profile individual. Indeed. Uh, Eric, thank you for your time. Really nice to speak. Yeah, that's Eric Fidali, who's a lawyer over there in New York. He represents Bloom, the legal firm. He's a partner there, which represented nine of Epstein's uh, victims. Victims. Thank you to him, and we'll continue uh, to take calls and points on that as well. Uh, comments coming from you, 0344 499 1000. Now, moving on to another story today and at the start of the year, that's almost certain to have a general... We understand at some point in the year we're almost certain to have a general election. Takir Starmer made his pitch to the nation today. To change Britain, we must change ourselves. We need to clean up politics. No more VIP fast lanes. No more kickbacks for colleagues. No more revolving doors between government and the companies they regulate. I will restore standards in public life with a total crackdown on cronyism. I've put expense cheap politicians in jail before. And I didn't care if they were Labour or Tory. There it is, outlining that he wants the election to be fought on the economy. The Labour leader said he wanted to defeat the Conservatives with, quote, Project Hope. Meanwhile, Rishi Sunak has today quashed speculation about a spring vote, indicating that any election will take place in the second half of the year. Joining me now is Patrick Diamond, former Labour advisor and professor of public policy, Queen Mary University of London, and Harry Phibbs, journalist at Conservative Home. Welcome to you both. Um, 
Uh, Patrick, firstly, um, give us your assessment of the man who says he's going to be the next Prime Minister. Well, he's making a confident pitch uh, to the nation today. I think coming off the back of, obviously, strong opinion poll leads last year, you know, Labour well positioned for the next election, but obviously still a lot of questions yet to be answered about what precise direction Starmer wants to take the country in, as well as some details around public spending, fiscal policy, tax and so on. So I think Starmer starts the year in a strong, confident position, but he still has a lot of work to do ahead of the election. And Harry, uh, I mean, similarly, did, did Starmer do anything today that would have enamoured a floating voter to hop over the red fence? I don't think so. No, it was a, a very boring speech. Obviously, he's got very boring monotone delivery, but the substance was dull too. There were, there were no uh, new policy announcements. He, he did the rhetoric, included the word hope a lot and the word change a lot. And other politicians have done that, of course, without it having any substance. We've had Tony Blair and, and Barack Obama, but, but they were much better in terms of the oratory. I think it almost makes it more embarrassing if he, if he tries to uh, put in a lot of sort of highfalutin um, rhetoric with the, with the mundane um, delivery. But I think what will be, in a way, disappointing to any, uh, any Conservative who, who was thinking of going over to the Labour Party was that he, his criticisms over the government uh, failing to provide um, tax cuts, being not, not, not being aspirational for people wanting to start businesses or, or home ownership, that resonated. But there was no substance. When he was asked about, well, well if you're saying the tax burden is too high, would you reduce tax? He, you know, he gave no um, undertaking there. He just talked about having um, even even higher taxes. So there's no there's no coherence really of what he would do differently. Uh, and Patrick, one of the, uh, the the points that he I think almost responding to Richard Tice yesterday, who talked about Labour and the Tories are pretty much you know two sides of the same coin, the consocialists or something of that nature. Um, Mr. Summer said, do not listen to siren voices that say we're all the same. What would you argue are the salient, the obvious, the seismic differences between Labour and the Tories? Well, I think that the, the comments about Labour and the Conservatives converging obviously reflect the fact that all governments in the foreseeable future are going to be constrained by the state of the British economy, you know, weak growth performance, lack of room for manoeuvre on public spending and tax. Um, and that isn't going to change regardless of um, who's in power. But I think what Starmer's trying to do is signal areas in which a Labour government under him would be different. So obviously today he's talking about cleaning up politics and regulating politics better, particularly in the light of some of the egregious scandals that seem to have occurred during the COVID-19 pandemic. Also talking about institutional reform, the way in which he might democratise the institutions of um, British government. But look, we know Starmer's approach. He is, in relative terms, a safety first politician. He's not going to go into the election with lots of commitments that can be attacked by the Conservatives. He's going to seek a mandate based on promising a very specific set of changes around green investment, around economic reform, planning and housing. Um, but it will be in government, I think, the nature of the change that Starmer's offering really becomes clear. And, and Harry, say, same point on that. It, it's an accusation that is made quite a lot that these, you know, the, the Sunaks and the Starmers of this world are very sort of establishment kind of now, now professional politicians. They have both had previous careers, but uh, they are cut from the same cloth. The difference is... Uh, it's a nuanced thing, really. There's no, there's no chasm there. At least with Corbyn, you could say, right, that's what socialism looks like. He's a proud Marxist. That's what he would call himself. Fine. Uh, we get the difference. Do you think voters will struggle with that difference between Sunak and Starmer? Well, I think as far as Starmer's concerned, he's all over the <laughs> shop. And when he was standing for leader of the Labour Party four years ago, he, he had this video where he was um, very much in, literally embracing... Corbyn and stressing all, all his background as a, as a radical human rights lawyer and standing up for striking coal miners and, and, and Greenpeace activists and how anti-establishment he was. Then he's been trying to reassure us uh, he talk, and talking about his establishment credentials, really, and, and this is going on about um, DPP, the Director of Public Prosecutions, which was a post, of course, the last Labour government appointed him to, which 
past the bit of context for his claims about getting rid of um, cronyism in, in, in politically favoured public appointments. And now he's trying to sort of slightly change again by, by, by saying, oh, yes, he believes in change and he's anti-Westminster and a, a popular revolt. So I, 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 think he's, I think he's sort of floundering a bit. I mean, as far as Rishi Sunak is concerned, I think what Conservatives have been we will be looking for is for him to give some clear, distinctive, um, conservative message backed up with with proper policies. So there's the the, the big things this year will be getting the um, veins off to Rwanda if that happens, and that's a big test. And the budget if he gets some proper um, cuts in tax, which would need which would need I think needs to get proper um, savings in public spending, and, and and say look that this is this is a clear alternative because we've got uh, a proper conservative government. I mean that's. That's what Conservatives will be hoping for, but so far, not too much sign of it. Uh, and Patrick, as, as we move towards an election, which we find out today, a little bit, a little bit of information from uh, Rishi Sunat that it's likely to be uh, in the autumn. No, no huge surprise. There were some that swore it would be spring, but I think the smart money was on autumn. Um, he alluded to that. What do you think the big issue is likely to be? What would it be argued on come that election day? Obviously, Starmer's... Uh, got a great card to play. He can say, "I haven't, you know, I haven't been here for 13 years. These guys have. If there's a stench around, it ain't me, Governor. Um, I can try and put it right." But he can't keep playing that card. What are the policies? Do you think that he'll lock into that will engage with the electorate? I think the election will be fought on really two issues. One is the state of the economy, and the second is incumbency. In other words. The Conservatives have been in power for 14 years and should they be rewarded with four or five more years in office? On the economy, I mean, this is the determining issue in almost all British general elections. 2019, to some extent, was a deviation from that because Brexit, as you know, was such a prominent issue then, given the need for the UK to agree a withdrawal arrangement with the European Union at that point. But most general elections have been fought on the question of which party is best placed to manage the economy, who is the most competent manager, and which party will deliver what voters want, particularly on core issues like tax, uh, cost of living, efficient management of public expenditure. And I think most of what we hear from both of the leaders in the run-up to the election will focus on those issues. There is also, though, the question of incumbency, as I said, and this really this issue of the Conservatives have been in power for a long time. Is this election, therefore, going to be a change election, which is about a new direction for the country, whatever that means precisely? Um, or is it going to be an election in which the electorate cleaves towards a safety first approach of sticking with what it knows, having four or five more years of the Conservatives because it trusts them to navigate their way through the country's economic difficulties? So I think it will be an election fought around the economy and around the question of change versus more of the same. Yeah, and uh, Harry, we, we know that you know, we often hear that immigration is right up there, uh, which it is in many many areas uh, but interesting when, when people are polled in some constituencies it's not number it's on the list but it's not necessarily number one so where do you think Rishi so what territory do you think Rishi Sunak will try to occupy come the election what's going to be his number one area that he can argue as far as he's concerned successfully well I think delivering the Rwanda uh, policy getting the fights off and then in large numbers and then that proving a, a deterrent in terms of the the putting the people smugglers out of business. That's, that's absolutely imperative for Rishi Sunak. And um, Keir Starmer's made a big mistake by saying that even if that policy works and is effective, that he would still scrap it. So I think that would get the Conservatives, you know, sort of sort of back in the game. Um, but, I mean, I do think there will still be a lot of um, sort of resentment over 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 high tax and uh, and over the long uh, period in office and the sort of time for, time for a change message. And it's hard for the Conservatives to, to make voters scared of, of Keir Starmer, given that Keir Starmer's cunning strategy of being very boring. I think all they perhaps could do is say, look at what's happened when Labour in power, look at Wales. I think the Conservatives might talk a lot about Wales and the poor school standards, mm. uh, all the woke uh, stuff, and, and, and try and say, look, Keir Starmer said that's his blueprint. That's, that's what he would uh, do. And if Keir Starmer won't define himself very clearly, then... That does leave him vulnerable to the to the Conservatives um, defining him as they as they choose before the election.
Yeah, you mentioned the woke stuff there. Uh, just a final point, Patrick. Do you think... How, how big an issue is that? I know people like me get quite excited about some of the curious ways that, I don't know, the language police have jumped into our lives or the social media intelligentsia have decided that this is unacceptable to discuss this or debate that, etc. How real do you think that is with the electorate? So I think it is an issue, and I think um, so-called culture war questions will play some role in the election. I think that's partly, of course, because I mean, we haven't discussed so far in, in this discussion the issue of Reform UK um, running in the election. Of course, they're going to stand in all constituencies, including against Conservative candidates. And I think that that could encourage the Conservative leadership to perhaps shift more in a direction of speaking to culture war issues, which they believe will... Um, encourage some Conservative supporters and previous Conservative voters to stick with the Tories at the next election. The only other thing I would say, though, is that, coming back to what I mentioned earlier, it is the economy that really determines British election outcomes. And so I think for the Conservatives, uh, a strategy of emphasising culture war issues might shore up some of their base, but it is not the basis on which to win or be the largest party after the next election. Uh, we will watch with interest and we'll, we will speak more, uh, undoubtedly, uh, between now and then. Listen, Patrick, Harry, thank you both for your time this afternoon. Patrick Diamond and Harry Fibbs with us here on Talk TV. Uh, lots more to come, including this after the break. Talk TV finds that police in England and Wales were forced to destroy three dangerous dogs every single day last year. That's up 143% on 2022 as the number of attacks rise. We'll talk about that next time, Ian Collins. You're with Talk on TV, radio, online, and, of course, your smart speaker. We're here! Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. We're on your smart speaker as well. Criminals to using XL bully dogs as weapons to threaten others. No matter how well trained, most dog owners will tell you a dog can turn. Do you know what I love about Talk Today? We do it all. Sunak, Suella, scones. I rather like David Cameron. I don't sort of bear him any ill will because he delivered the referendum that he said he would deliver. The Tories love a scrap. You can almost see this coming round the tracks with Suella Braverman. She's heading up one side and Rishi Sunak the other. The police are pro-Palestine. That is just not right. You swear an oath in the police to act without fear or favour. The COVID inquiry seems to have turned into a sort of pantomime. There's not really any substance to it. It's hard to know whether it's a farce or a tragedy. For the amount of time it's taken, the number of illegal migrants currently sent by us to Rwanda, zilt. The amount of money it's cost, we're saying, what are we saying it's cost? About 140 million. 140 million pounds so far. So 140 million pounds, so far result, nil, absolutely nil. Are we only going to be trusting sources like Meta and Google? Where is our unbiased news going to come from? Calais in winter is cold. <laughs> that is from the Jeremy Corbyn book. Kevin O'Sullivan is the worst presenter on talk TV. Sitting on his fat ass, <laughs> talking for a living. If you're walking towards me and you're a vegan, you should have a great big orange sticker over here saying, watch out, vegans about. The weirdest plank that we've had in, what, yeah. three years? Hundreds and hundreds of mice in a box, which he walked into a branch of McDonald's. McMouse Man. McMouse Man, yeah. McMouse Man. He should be easy enough to catch this guy, shouldn't he? I mean, he's got a house full of mice. <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> This is a major summit. President Biden decided this was important after watching a Tom Cruise film. Sunak and the current Conservative government are not Conservative. Why don't you leave that party and come to one that actually shares uh, your ideologies? This has been a party political broadcast uh, on behalf no, of I the don't. Reform UK party. Hi, I'm Ofcom. Just, just... Kids think all they have to do is take pictures of everything. Just shut down TikTok. Problem solved. This is really unfair. What's, what, what's unfair? If it's on camera, we're not doing the interview. Yes, I'm going to do. I'm you're, going to, you're going to resign? Yes, because I cannot continue my work. When I say I am God, I'm not joking. Did you feel Elvis was controlling? I've been answering your question, you answer mine. It's actually not my job to answer your questions. Just Are you prepared you. to call is Hamas possible, a terror group? Is it possible to have a rational you can't, discussion can you? with you? I've asked you two questions. Should Hamas stay in power and are they a terror group? You're refusing to answer either of them. They've that won. is very telling. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. You've done a book on poetry. Poetry and music for the many. I love poetry. We can agree on that.
And welcome back to the show. I'm Ian Collins. You're with Talk TV on TV, radio, online, and of course on your smart speaker. Now to that news that police in England and Wales are being forced to destroy three dangerous dogs every single day amid a rise in attacks. Uh, this is an exclusive investigation by Talk TV has found that a record-breaking 1,230 animals were destroyed last year. That's up 143% in 2022. The shocking findings come in the same week that the government brought in a phased ban on XL bully dogs, believed to be responsible for up to a quarter of all attacks in the UK. Joining me now is dog behaviourist and trainer Niall Barnes. Niall, afternoon to you. Afternoon. Good to have you with us. Um, well, firstly, were you surprised by this number? Three dangerous dogs a day uh, are destroyed by the police. Yeah, it's a shocking number. It's gone up. I think the, the percentage it's gone up is the thing that's really shocking. The number itself, obviously, it is what it is, but the, the rise is, is, I guess, quite concerning. Yeah. Um, it's concerning in, in terms of evidence that we have bad owners or evidence that we have too many bad dogs? I think it's evidence that dogs are finding it harder and harder to live in the society that, that we're asking them to live in. There's more and more dogs that are being bred more and more and often they're being given to owners that probably shouldn't have them so a, a little bit of both i guess I'm, I'm glad to hear you say that because i often hear people almost refute that um and find almost a curious defense for this but i know some of this is anecdotal some of it is stuff we see on youtube and twitter and the like but there does seem to be a fairly persuasive body of evidence that some of the last people on planet Earth that sh should be owning these dogs are the very ones that own these dogs. Yeah, exactly that. Some of the, the owners that get these dogs get them because of the power and the size and the tenacity of them, and they aren't really bothered about the well-being of the dog, and that ends up with the dog then displaying behaviours that it, it, it get it in trouble. So, yeah, yeah it's... It's not just the dog, it's the owners too, but it's not just the owners. Sometimes it's it's the dog in terms of maybe it's been poorly bred, poorly raised by the breeder. There's, there's plenty of backyard breeders out there that are contributing to this problem yeah. as much as negligent owners. But you, you kind of look at some of these characters who, you know, there's clearly a sort of badge of honour thing, you know, weaponising your dog as well. We saw it a few years ago, didn't we? And then it kind of went away a bit and now seems to have returned again. Um, the idea that this is a status symbol, walking down the road with, you know, a, what looks like a fairly vicious bit of kit on a lead, uh, knowing it can do damage. If you pull the lead a certain mm -hmm. way, you've trained it to bark and get angry, and, you know, the, who knows what kind of hell the poor dog suffers when it's behind closed doors as well, because they don't tend to uh, live or be housed in very conducive places or run around with proper exercise. And it's a... As you're alluding to here, now it's a recipe really for real frustration within the dog, uh, which manifests in, in anger. It's not, not hard to get one of those dogs to attack because they lead lives that are, are just not conducive with, with anything other than that, I suppose. But in terms of training them, um, I mean, you run a, a very respectable training empire. You know your way around the behaviour of a dog. Uh, the, the, the people that tend to own these are the very last people that are that likely to come to somebody like you. Yeah, I, I've said this in the past. I know, and I can, I can name off the top of my head, sort of 10, 15 XL owners that I would trust with my own dogs tomorrow. If I needed someone to have my dogs, I would trust them in a heartbeat. But that's because they're the responsible people that come to, to dog trainers like myself, and they're the people that that are doing everything they can to make sure their dog is kept safe and is well raised. The people that you've mentioned there, those people that are raising these dogs as a status symbol, those people that shouldn't have these dogs but are allowed to, they're not coming to me, so I don't yeah. really get to train the dogs that are often the ones that need me the most. When we hear people use the phrase, there's no such thing as a bad dog, only bad owners, I mean, that's not entirely true, is it? I mean, there are clearly dogs and breeds that have a, either a propensity to attack or perhaps maybe more honestly, if they did... You know, I've got a cockapoo, for goodness sake. Now, a cockapoo could take a chunk out your leg if it wanted to, but if there was a battle between me and the cockapoo, I'm pretty darn sure I could win it. I'm not absolutely sure I'd win a battle with an XL bully. Yeah, the, the reason why we love these dogs so much, there's plenty... Like I said, those owners, their dogs, I love them, absolutely adore those dogs. 
But part of what we love about them is that they're impulsive and they're tenacious and they are independent and they are they are strong. We we like that about them, but unfortunately, so do those people who who mm. probably shouldn't own them. And yeah. for me, it's it's like you said, it's it seemed to go away for a while. And I think the fact that it's come back is proof that this legislation, that the the the, the breed specific legislation, it doesn't really work because. We'll be back here in five, six years if nothing else changes with yeah. the, the Corso or the Doberman or the Rottweiler or whatever other dog that starts to get overbred and being sold as a as a status symbol. We'll be back here if there aren't more harsh consequences for owners who get the dog, mistreat it, misraise it, and allow it to act in dangerous ways. I think we'll, we're just going to be back having these same conversations if there isn't more harsh consequences for the the mishandling and misownership of dogs. Yeah, I, I, I sense you're absolutely bang on there, Niall. And uh, as we speak, people are interbreeding these dogs anyway to, to create ever more um, evasive breeds so they can uh, confidently say, no, that's not an XL bully. And, you know, are, is every local area likely to be, you know, DNA testing the dog? Probably not. It becomes cumbersome. And as you rightly say, um, unless there are consequences, then who knows where it goes? Listen, Niall, Thank you for your time. We appreciate that. Niall thank Barnes, you. NB Dog Training is his company, and thank you to him for that conversation. Uh, well, watch with interest, but I do sense it's not the, uh, the end of this dangerous dog story by a long shot. Uh, before we go, some breaking news in the past half an hour, and detectives investigating the murder of Harry Pittman have released images of two people they're keen to identify and speak with. Uh, this is a terrible story. 16-year-old Harry died after being stabbed whilst watching fireworks on London's Primrose Hill on New Year's Eve after becoming involved in a fight with another male. Um, so you saw those images there. There'll be more on this story. There they are. Police are interested to identify these two people. Invariably, once those pictures are out publicly, it doesn't really take long uh, for somebody to be able to contact the police and give some information. This is merely about helping with inquiries and often about elimination, so do come forward. Sadly, we have come to the end of the show. Uh, lots more to debate here on Talk TV throughout the course of the afternoon. Thank you for tuning in. Please do, do join me at the same time tomorrow. Up next, it's Daisy McAndrew sitting in for Vanessa Feltz. Have a good afternoon. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. We're on your smart speaker as well. Criminals using XL bully dogs as weapons to threaten others. No matter how well trained, most dog owners will tell you a dog can turn. Do you know what I love about Talk Today? We do it all. Sunak, Suella, scones. I rather like David Cameron. I don't sort of bear him any ill will because he delivered the referendum that he said he would deliver. The Tories love a scrap. You can almost see this coming round the tracks with Suella Bravman. She's heading up one side and Rishi Sunak the other. The police are pro-Palestine. That is just not right. You swear an oath in the police to act without fear or favour. The Covid inquiry seems to have turned into a sort of pantomime. There's not really any substance to it. It's hard to know whether it's a farce or a tragedy. For the amount of time it's taken, the number of illegal migrants currently sent by us to Rwanda, zilch. The amount of money it's cost, we're saying, what are we saying it's cost? About 140 million. 140 million pounds so far. So 140 million pounds, so far result, nil, absolutely nil. Are we only going to be trusting sources like Meta and Google? Where is our unbiased news going to come from? Calais in winter is cold. <laughs> that is from the Jeremy Corbyn book. Kevin O'Sullivan is the worst presenter on talk TV. Sitting on his fat ass, <laughs> talking for a living. If you're walking towards me and you're a vegan, you have a great big orange 